for you, Bree, because she's going to miss both of them. Ready? Sucks for you, Bree. You're going to miss both of them. Oh, All right. Wait. Yeah, well, you know, you know, it's uh, audience sing along. You're not a very good audience. Okay, so um, I'm going to very, gonna very quickly make the final comments uh, that I didn't get to make at the end of the last um, lecture, and then we're going to launch into today's topic proper. So um, we ended last time from uh, with an example of a constant density interior solution. And our, what we found is that if m was greater than 4 ninths, uh, the radius over g Then the, then the object must undergo time evolution. Because we, we did our whole interior solution based on the assumption of time independence. And we found this condition that if n was greater than 4 ninths r over g, where m is the mass of the source, r is the radius of the source. If the mass is bigger than this, then Kara, what happened to our solution? Where did, what was the problem that arose? Yeah, the pressure at r equals zero actually blows up to infinity. We we're basically looking at a denominator going to zero in the pressure expression. Okay, so um, so I want to finish up with some comments on this. First of all, if it evolves with time, then what we have is the uh, the energy density rho is trying to pull everything to the center, and the pressure is trying to balance it. And what we're what we're finding is that in this situation. There's so much energy density trying to pull it to the center that the pressure can't keep up. The pressure can't be infinity. So what's going to happen, obviously, is that the system is going to start collapsing. But if it collapses, what's going to happen is the mass is going to stay the same, and R is just going to get smaller and smaller, which means it's going to continue satisfying this. So as it collapses, it's just going to keep satisfying that even worse. So it's going to continue collapsing. Um, but we really need to ask uh, a couple of questions about the real world and whether that result actually applies to the real world. So the first question is, um, is a constant density model for a stellar object a realistic model? Turns out it's actually a pretty good, it's a pretty good approximation to the, the energy density of a star that it's actually uniform. But it turns out, as is often the case in general relativity, some very smart people studied the more general case and there is a result due to Bookdahl, and yeah, I'm gonna spell it right. A well, Bookdahl's theorem that establishes that even for more general energy uh, distributions, energy density distributions, uh, this condition still determines uh, whether or not uh, it can support itself under collapse. So you don't actually have to rely on that constant energy density in order to get uh, collapse under this. Now, here is the more interesting observation. For our sun, if we calculate the value of 4 ninths r over g, and if you're really quick with your units and you study that for a minute, you realize that the units of r over g are not the units of mass, something is off. And this is, of course, one of those places where we have secretly got a factor of c squared working, which you could reestablish by thinking about the units. But if we put c squared back in to actually get a numerical value, then we find that this quantity for our sun comes out to be 1.38 times 10 to the 27 kilograms, which is satisfying because if we actually look at the mass of the sun, it's 1.98 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So in the real world, Our sun should collapse. What? Well, well, I mean, this number is three orders of magnitude bigger than that number. It's clearly satisfying that condition. So, Tom, what do you think? Why isn't our sun collapsing? It's evolving in time. It is evolving in time, but the time evolution would be collapse. So, what what do you think is? Like our sun satisfies this condition, but our sun's hanging out. It's been hanging out for a while. Is it because it's spinning? 
It's a good guess, but doesn't have a constant density. Doesn't matter. But Bell's theorem says you really don't have to rely on it. And just uh, the pressure of fusion is pushing out. Say again. The pressure of fusion is pushing. Exactly. This entire analysis was only looking at gravity. It was ignoring any other forces. A star has thermonuclear interactions going on in its core, and it's creating an outward pressure. Okay. So if you just play the gravity game and you shut off all the other forces, then 4 ninths R over G is the limit. But stars are actually these nuclear powerhouses. They're burning fuel, and so they have an outward pressure. Now, of course, stars' fuel systems are finite. Eventually, stars do burn out of fuel. And then the question becomes, OK, when they're out of fuel, and you don't have the contribution to the pressure from this uh, nuclear interaction, then you've got the gravity trying to pull the thing in. And the question is, is there some other force that's going to come into play trying to stop it? So first of all, is electromagnetism going to help you? Probably not. No. I mean, what's the electrical charge of the sun? Yeah. It's largely neutral. Okay, I mean, microscopic objects are largely electrically neutral. Most atoms or molecules, molecular structures are electrically neutral. So they're, they're just, all those atoms and molecules are going to be able to coalesce without worrying about electrical repulsion. Okay, so electromagnetism is not really going to help you. The weak nuclear force is not really going to help you. Um, you know, you could save it with a whole slew of neutrinos or something. I don't know. I'm just kidding about that. But anyway, but it turns out that there are some additional new interesting things that can happen to stop collapse. One of them is that, so post fuel uh, uh, burnout. So we collapse, and we have a couple of options that can actually stop it. First of all, at a certain point, the thing is getting so small that you've got a very large number of electrons that you're trying to stack on top of each other. And when you try and put a bunch of electrons in the same region of space, there's a quantum mechanical effect that actually says, no, no, no. And what is that called? That's the Pauli exclusion principle. So at a certain point, you can actually have what is called the electron degeneracy pressure which is something you should have kind of seen the, the elements of it in your chemistry class, but you should see, you should have seen it in 320, your physics class. This idea that if you try and push identical particles together and they're fermions, quantum mechanics actually creates a repulsive sort of force. Okay? Um, so it turns out that electron degeneracy pressure, it, it can stop a collapsing star as long as the star is not too big. And if that stops it, then you're left with what's called a white dwarf. Okay? So there are white dwarfs hanging out there. They happen to be stars which were bigger than that. They collapsed, and electron degeneracy pressure slowed them down. And once you've got electron degeneracy pressure stopping you, you don't have to worry about that running out because it's not a fuel kind of thing. It's literally a quantum mechanical effect that won't go away. Um, Chandrasekhar, a name you've probably heard of in, this, in the context of stars and stellar evolution and so forth, he demonstrated that this is okay as long as M is less than 1.4 solar masses. So you can have a star that's bigger than our sun, or even our sun itself when it, when it finally expires, um, and as long as the total mass of the thing that's collapsing is less than 1.4 times our sun's mass, it will end up as a white dwarf. If it's bigger than that, then what's going to happen is it's going to continue to collapse. And eventually, um, the electrons and the protons are going to fuse through nuclear interactions to form neutrons. And then you're going to be putting neutrons on top of neutrons. And so you can actually get, at a higher density, a stop to the collapse through neutron degeneracy pressure. And if that ends up being the case, then you are left with, surprise, surprise, a neutron star. Okay, And it turns out that a neutron star is the result as long as the mass is less than three or four times the mass of our sun. That's called the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit. Um, but if you have a stellar object whose mass is larger than four times our sun's mass, you can be sure that its eventual fate 
is collapsed to a singularity, which brings us to today's topic. You got two hands, so you guys find out. I'm going to raise while you ask. So, so is there an upper limit to uh, the size of stars? Like, is there a biggest star out there? I, I mean, is there like a mathematical derived upper limit? No, uh, I don't think there's, there's not a mathematical derivation to an upper limit. Um, ah, well, it's not, so first of all, what you have to understand in a lot of this is that this is a combination of general relativity and nuclear physics. So when you actually study stellar interior models, that's a really interesting subject because you have to know a lot about nuclear physics, which in some sense requires some knowledge of particle physics. Um, but then you also really have to know about general relativity because you're studying things that are so big that you can't ignore the effects of general relativity. So the, 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 the question you're asking might be, is there a star so big that it doesn't matter, the nuclear interactions can't stop it from collapsing? So that's one question you might ask. Um, but another question you might be meaning to ask is, are there limits on like the way the universe formed that such that there's a largest possible star just based on the evolution of the universe? And I don't know if there's an answer to that. I mean, I'm sure there is. You can't have a star as big as the whole universe. <laughs> but I don't actually have, a, have an idea off the top of my head what sort of upper limit there. Has anybody taken uh, the nuclear physics course here where they talk about stellar evolution? You didn't talk about it, yeah. So I don't. Couldn't there just be like a certain size where, like, the, the the force at the center would just be so strong that it would kind of like create a black hole? Like, it would get. I guess what you were saying. Like, well, yeah, it would just be like a, a super massive star that like grows and then collapses on the same Like, I guess it's not. I mean, largely in this context, so I'm more than happy to go off in fantasy land and not worry about the real world. Right. But not a lot of people put a lot of their hooks into the nuclear astrophysics in sort of imaginary land scenarios. Like, I'm happy to do topological black holes in three dimensions, but you don't see the nuclear astrophysics community really embracing that. So, the universe is infinite, they'd be super into that. Possibly. Okay, you guys got to ask your questions quickly because I've got nine pages of notes on black holes I'd love to cover. Okay. Um, so for the neutron star, you yep. said that the mass would be less than three to four solar masses. Is there some reason that's a range as opposed to an actual number? Or is it just a not well-defined number? Well, I, I'm not an expert in nuclear astrophysical models, but it might take into account um, differences in uh, uh, energy density profiles. Uh, it might take into account rotation. I'm not 100% sure. And I mean, also, you're working with a lot of approximations. I mean, interior solutions are very, very difficult, even if you're just doing pure gravity. Then you go back and add in the nuclear pressures, and finding exact analytic interior solutions is really difficult. So there, there are probably, what it is is there's probably a lot of assumptions that are made, and the result of their assumptions and the wiggle room in the assumptions is reflected in that three to four number. I kind of wanted to answer this question. So basically, there's an idea that the bigger, the bigger a star is, the faster its flight time is, so the rather the shorter its flight time is. And so there's no known upper bound on that. So like if a star was as big as all of the matter in the universe, it might, we don't know exactly what would happen. So because there's no star like that, obviously. OK. I'm going to talk about black holes. Great. They're, they're, they're awesome. OK. So uh, this is the Schwarzschild metric. It is the spherically symmetric solution to Einstein's equations in a vacuum. OK? So remember, this is solving Einstein's equations when t mu is 0, which written in trace reverse form looks like that. And um, the argument that we made was that this is the exterior solution for any spherically symmetric thing. So it could be a star, it could be a planet, it could be a black hole. Clearly, something interesting is going on when R goes to 2GM or 0. When R goes to 2GM, this quantity disappears, this quantity diverges. Okay. 
When r goes to zero, this quantity disappears and this quantity diverges, okay? So the first thing we need to talk about is, okay, what's happening at those two radii? So uh, the first thing to, to kind of think a little bit about is 2gm. So r equals 2gm, if this thing applies to, say, a planet or a star, what if you have a star and you get within r equals 2g to the value of r equals 2gm? No. Yeah. You melt. Oh, you melt. Yeah. I, <laughs> yes, that's actually exactly right. Um, because it turns out that for astrophysical objects, the value r equals 2gm is actually in the interior. So if you got to this value, and I actually did this analysis back when I was talking about per, uh, evidence for general relativity, and I gave you r equals 2gm for all of these different, I think I might have given you 6gm actually, for a lot of different objects. But the value r equals 2gm for stars and planets and neutron stars and white dwarfs, that's actually in the interior, which means this is not the solution. You have to go back to the interior model, okay? r equals 2gm is only exterior for a black hole, okay? Because a black hole is how big? It's zero. <laughs> it's a singularity. Everything is at zero. And 2gm is not zero, okay? Now zero is obviously a problem, okay? But 2gm is a position you can get to in the vicinity of a black hole. It is a special position because the metric is going cray cray, but is it a bad thing? We're gonna talk about that. Um, okay, so before I, before I get into the technical details, one thing I just want to remind you, because in the popular literature, black holes get a really bad rap. Um, if you are outside of a black hole, say you're at, I don't know, like r equals 30 gm, there's really no difference between being at that distance from a black hole versus that distance from a star. The black hole's not pulling you any harder than the star is. They have the same geometry, okay? In fact, I would probably rather be that far from a black hole than a star, because being that far from a star probably means melting, okay? So it's not like black holes are floating through the universe gobbling everything up. Their gravitational impact is really no worse than the star that collapsed to form them, okay? So that is not what makes black holes interesting. Uh, okay, so... Uh, all right, let's um, talk about very quickly before we go on, and I, I really, I, I feel like I have to do this because we taught you this in physics one and it was so terrible. Um, but I'm gonna just do this really quick and I will appropriately label it a stupid idea. So let's talk for a minute about a stupid idea. So um, you're all aware of this calculation uh, and I, so I'm gonna go through it very, very quickly. Um, and it is, it is associated with the calculation of escape velocity for an object. So if we have a gravitationally bound system or an object undergoing the gravitational pull of some planet, for example, then we can calculate the escape velocity by basically taking the kinetic energy that you're launching from the surface with, uh, adding to that the gravitational potential. So the little m is the object that you're trying to make escape. The big M is the actual object you're trying to get it to escape from. So the big M might be the Earth. The little m might be the thing you're trying to get all the way away from the Earth. So if we choose the, um, the additive constant in our potential to be zero, um, then what we're saying here is that uh, by setting the total energy equals to zero, uh, V goes to zero as r goes to zero, okay? And what this means is that you've got this planet, you've got this little object, you're gonna launch it with a, a velocity v escape, and when it gets to infinity, its velocity is gonna go to zero. That's the smallest velocity that it could escape with. If you gave it a larger velocity, when it gets to infinity, it would keep moving, so you gave it more energy than you needed to. So that's sort of the minimum amount, okay? And so if you take this and you solve for the value of the escape, then you find that this is 2gm over r. And then you find this really interesting thing. If r is equal to 2gm, okay, 
then the escape is equal to 1. But in this class, 1 is code for C. Okay? So here, in this analysis, what we found is that if R is equal to 2GM, then the escape velocity is the speed of light. Is this thing a black hole? Not according to this analysis, not by a long shot. Okay? Here are the errors in trying to say this is a black hole. Okay? First of all, the idea of escape velocity is that you launch this with a velocity, it moves away, and this is the only energy it's given. Okay? There is nothing in this analysis that says you can't put a little booster on this and let him propel himself. Okay? The other thing is that if you are inside of R equals 2GM, the only condition this is saying is that with that much energy, so if, I, so if, if like this is R equals 2GM, and you start out inside, this analysis is simply saying you won't get to infinity, but you will go out here, for example. You will actually move outside of this radius. You just won't get to infinity. That is not at all the way a black hole works. Once you're in the bad, bad region for a black hole, there is no outward motion at all. The only motion is towards the center. So it is a happy accident that the numbers kind of match up between this. This is a Newtonian analysis, by the way. The result of the Newtonian analysis cranks out this 2GM that you get in general relativity, but the implications cannot be understood from the Newtonian analysis. It's just this model is completely... I mean, what it's saying about the escape velocity is true, but it doesn't elucidate that this thing is a black hole. We really want to know what a black hole is. So that's what we're going to spend today and next time talking about. So what is a black hole? Okay, so... Um, the first thing that we're going to think about here is uh, this guy, because I, you know, it's like that shouldn't be that bad. This, yeah, that's bad, because an entire star is sitting in R equals zero. That would probably just be a bad place to go. But this, like, you know, how bad is it? What's going on there? Let's see if we can figure out what's going on there. Okay? So, um... Uh, there's a comment that I want to make. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was a little comment earlier. And that is, um, I'm going to preface the entire black hole analysis with the following observation. Black hole, so R equals zero for black hole, bad business, okay? But what makes black holes so fascinating and what physicists spend their time doing when they play with black holes is studying things outside of R equals zero. At R equals zero, our theory breaks down. General relativity isn't going to work. But it turns out that there's a lot of really amazing, mind-blowing physics that happens for values of R bigger than zero. Okay, so that's what we're going to spend most of our time focusing on, starting with this value 2GM. Okay, so... Um, At 2GM, this guy is blowing up. The metric is going to infinity. That might make us worry. Maybe the curvature of space-time, which is the, how you see the effects of gravity, maybe the curvature of space-time is going cray-cray. So before I actually directly uh, approach it with the Schwarzschild geometry, I'm actually going to approach the same situation in a geometry much, much more familiar to you. Okay? So consider, and then we'll come back to this, Consider the plane, R2, okay? But when we consider the plane, we're going to use polar coordinates to describe it. And the metric in polar coordinates is just 1, 0, 0, R squared. The inverse of that metric is 1, 1 over R squared, okay? And you immediately notice some, some interesting features of this description. When r goes to zero, the metric is becoming very degenerate. That bottom right diagonal term is going to zero, which is reflected in the fact that the inverse is divergent. Okay. So in this situation, r equals zero looks bad. 
the metric and the inverse metric are doing very, very naughty things. Okay? That's why I wore my cool shirt all ragged. That dude's gonna make that comment. I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> Forget about everything I'm just showing you. Okay? Think about R2. Is there anything weird happening in R equals zero? No. No, is R equals zero any different than any other point? No. No, it's, it's like a plane. You can just pick any point, call it R equals zero. So the fact that R equals zero is doing something wonky is tied to our particular description, not the geometry itself. Okay? The geometry itself is as nice in R equals zero as it is everywhere else. All right? So we would like to know if there is a systematic way to address these kinds of weird looking behaviors that might not actually be bad behaviors. And so um, the first step in addressing such situations is that we first recall the metric is coordinate dependent. That is, the metric changes form when you change coordinates. The metric is not a very useful thing to look at to try and eyeball whether the geometry is good or bad because you can change it to a different form and it might completely change its behavior. <laughs> if you want to say once and for all the geometry is misbehaving, what kind of quantities should you consider? Curvature tensors? Invariance. Curvature invariance. So curvature tensor quanti quantities built from curvature tensors whose coefficients take the same value in any reference frame. Invariance, okay? So what we really want to look for are curvature invariance, but remember that the curvature tensor for this space, the Riemann curvature tensor, that is the thing you build all invariance from. This is the, the, the tensor which tells us everything about uh, our curvature of a space, the curvature tensor for this space is equal to what? Zero. It's equal to zero because this is a flat, flat space. So if I take that curvature tensor and I build any curvature invariant I want, so for example, if I build the Ricci scalar, well, it's going to be zero. And I can build other interesting invariants. So here's another one. So this example is pretty trivial in the sense that the whole Riemann curvature tensor vanishes, so anything you build from it vanishes. But curvature terms are what is the telling us about the geometry. And the fact that we're building invariance tells us that changing the coordinate system isn't going to change what that curvature term is telling us. Now there's a second lesson that we can get out of this, and that is we know there are better coordinates. So if you identify that in one set of coordinates, you're getting wonky behavior at a point, but from our analysis of the curvature, we know that the curvature is behaving at that point, then that should tell us, hey, there's probably a set of coordinates where that point is obviously fine and we know that set of coordinates, what set of coordinates are you most familiar with for the two-dimensional plane? X and Y. And if you actually used X and Y, which you can get from the polar coordinates with the usual substitutions, R cosine theta, R sine theta, then in this case, the metric just becomes the identity and is equal to the inverse metric, and clearly that matrix isn't going to do anything interesting when x equals 0 and y equals 0. Okay? Ryan, put your phone down, man. You're driving crazy. All right. So the moral of this lesson is there are situations where a coordinate taking a particular value can make the metric look cray-cray, but by analyzing the curvature invariance and then subsequently finding better coordinates so that it's obvious nothing crazy happening, we call such a singularity of the metric a coordinate <coughs> singularity. 
So this thing is a coordinate singularity, not a curvature singularity. A curvature singularity, by contrast, is one where the curvature invariance would blow up. Okay? Any questions about this example before we jump back to Schwarzschild? So coordinate singularities, they're just reflections of a bad choice of coordinates. There's nothing really interesting happening, at least in terms of the curvature. Okay? So going back to the Schwarzschild case, we're interested in this r equals 2gm. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is look at curvature invariance. Well, we know that r mu nu equals zero. So if I try to build things from the Ricci tensor, I know that those are all going to immediately vanish. So for example, if I try and build the Ricci scalar, that's going to vanish because you build it from the Ricci tensor. So for this space, you actually have to go all the way back to the curvature tensor. And the curvature tensor for this space is not vanish because there's actually curvature in this geometry. But what's interesting is if you form invariance out of that, these are just combinations where all the indices disappear. They all get summed over. What you discover is that this particular combination that is the, the curvature tensor with all the indices raised contracted with the curvature tensor with all the indices lowered gives us 48 g squared m squared over r squared and all others equal to zero. Any other curvature invariant you might build automatically is zero. This is the one that's not zero, but does this curvature invariant do anything bad when r is equal to 2gm? No, it's just a number. What about when r is equal to zero? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So here is evidence that r equals 2gm is a coordinate singularity, but r equals zero is a true curvature singularity. All right? So, you know, r equals zero is a bad place to go, but unfortunately general relativity can't be used right there. r equals 2gm, on the other hand, their physics should be fine. Like, we can use gr to describe r equals 2gm. So, what we should do is look for a better set of coordinates. All right? So coming back up here to label this, this is technically the Schwarzschild geometry in Schwarzschild coordinates. And it is imperative, it seems a little redundant at this point, but it is imperative for us to remember that that is the description of this geometry in those particular coordinates because what we're about to do is change coordinates. But we're still going to be describing the same geometry. Changing coordinates doesn't change the geometry. It just changes your description. Okay? So without any further ado, here is our first of several coordinate redefinitions. And I swear, when Zach Polanski took my class, I think this really stuck because when he did his master's with me, I swear to God that kid changed coordinates every day. He came up, oh, I got a new set of coordinates. You got to check out the metric in these. It drove me nuts. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the TR theta phi uh, of Schwarzschild and we are going to transform them to a set of coordinates called V, R, theta, and phi. And these are what are known as Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. Why is that so funny? Did you know Finkelstein? Fully out. 
Yeah, I know. Well, I'm, in the future, I'm just going to do EF for Eddington Finkelstein. Do oh, you mind know Finkelstein? I don't know Finkelstein. So my claim to fame is the Finkelstein, David Finkelstein was a professor at Georgia Tech when I was there, and I actually took a class from him. And uh, he's a really cool guy, but man, he was deep. And he kind of looked like Santa Claus. But uh, he's a really cool guy. Did a lot of interesting stuff in, in quantum gravity and so forth. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the coordinate redefinitions. And then we'll explore their consequences. So remember, the way to specify coordinate redefinition is to give the new coordinates as functions of the old ones. So I'm just going to lay these out. So, yeah, so first of all, uh, it's, it's not, you know, I'm not doing anything tricky. R theta phi is just going to be R theta phi. So those coordinates are actually not going to do anything weird. It's really just V and T that are going to do something weird. So V is actually going to be the old T plus the old R plus 2GM times the natural log of R over 2GM minus 1. And that's the magnitude bars around that to make sure the argument of our log is positive. And we can invert this, which will be useful, to solve for T in terms of V and R. And in that case, we get something like this. Okay. And the reason I'm doing that is because what I want to do is I want to figure out what dt squared is so that I can figure out what the metric looks like in the new coordinates. So t doesn't appear in the metric itself. It's time-independent Schwarzschild metric. I only have t in the dt squared, so I need an expression for dt squared, and I need to get that from this expression. So if we just crank out dt from this, we'll find that this is dv minus 1 minus 2gm over r to the minus 1 dr. Okay. This is the real magic from this weird looking expression. dt actually takes this really nice form. Okay, then if we plug that into the Schwarzschild metric and Schwarzschild coordinates, we find the following form of a metric. Where the proper name of this would be the Schwarzschild geometry in Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. Okay. So again, same geometry, just a different set of coordinates. Yeah. How do the units work out on V? How do the units work out on V? What do you mean? Well, what is V? Is V just an arbitrary? I mean. Well, what are you worried that you're adding time and space? Well, no, there's a there's a c there's a c in front of that t. Okay. Yeah, c is one. So time and space have the same units in this class because we set c equal to one. So so v has the same units. Of di it's a unit of distance, just like r and ct. Okay. Again, it's one of those points, like it was not obvious, so I didn't just look at it and go, oh, I'll write this down, you know? I mean, actually, uh, these coordinates are one of Finkelstein's claim to fame. Like, he's mentioned in popular books precisely because of finding these coordinates. So this, just getting this set of coordinates was a, a pretty big step. But there are some very important things to note about this coordinate system. First, In this coordinate system, r equals 2gm is fine. r equals 2gm, yeah, it makes this go to zero, but nothing is going to infinity. Infinity is what we worry about. Nothing bad here. Okay? r equals zero is bad. The singularity at r equals zero still persists, which we expect. You can't cure a true curvature singularity by changing coordinates. Okay? So what we're going to discover is the following. Schwarzschild coordinates are fine when you're outside of the star. 
or the or sorry the when you're outside of r equals two gm. So if you if you have you know this black hole, and then this distance is r equals two gm, if you're out here, then this metric is perfectly fine. Okay, but now suppose you want to start approaching that particular distance. As you approach the value r equals two gm, this metric goes crazy on you. Right. Now, on the other hand, if you started out inside of r equals 2 gm, this metric is also fine. If r is less than 2 gm, then this term can't vanish. I mean, we're, we're talking about bigger than r equals 0. So if you're at r equals less than 2 gm, the Schwarzschild coordinates do fine. Okay? So we can work here, or we can work outside with Schwarzschild, and everything's fine. What we cannot use Schwarzschild coordinates to do is to go from bigger than 2gm to smaller than 2gm because right at r equals 2gm, this set of coordinates goes crazy. This is a much better set of coordinates. They work outside, inside, and you can pass right through r equals 2gm with them without them doing anything stupid. So what you can say is that this is a coordinate system that is better suited to an observer who is passing from outside to inside of the radius r equals 2 gm. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to explore exactly what is happening at the value r equals 2 gm. And so, oh. That's fine, I'll just write it again, it's good, it's not a big deal. Um, okay, so if we, one of the things that we know is interesting about black holes is this idea of where you can go and where you can't go. Okay, everybody's heard of an event horizon, once you pass the event horizon, you can't get back out. Okay. So there's this idea of where can you as a physical object with mass bigger than zero, where in space-time can you actually go and if you are interested in exploring where you as a massive object can go, what aspect of the space-time should we study? Madison's one. I'm not sure I know exactly what you're asking. So if I have a space-time, and I say you were born there, and I ask where can you go, so go back to special relativity. If I say you're born there, where can you go in that space time? What would you consider? Light what are those called? Light cones. Light cones, exactly. I.e., the causal structure. Okay, what can cause an event? What can that event cause, etc.? So, if we're interested in determining where things can and can't go, we should be thinking about the behavior of light cones and the geometry. Now, we, we worked with light cones a bit in special relativity, and in that case, they were very easy because they always opened up at 45 degrees no matter where you were. But in a curved geometry, you're not guaranteed life is going to be so easy. And that is, in fact, where you get a lot of visual representation of what's going on in black hole geometry. So to that end, let us study light cones in this geometry. So first of all, if we want to study a light cone, what value should ds squared be? Ooh, Chase. Um, we should use the um, we should use the Schwarzschild metric um, for in the ef coordinates, right? <coughs> what is the numerical value of ds squared if you're a piece of light? Um, Zero. Zero. Okay. okay, that is the definition of the trajectories along which light moves. They move through space-time with a invariant path length of zero. Okay, a negative path length squared would be the trajectory of a massive object, and then a positive DS squared would be the trajectory of something moving back down. So, so you're right, though. Now that we've made this identification, we can go back to the metric to figure out what things look like. Okay. So um, what we're going to do to make life simple 
is to consider only radial motion. So just look at how things move in R. Don't worry about theta and phi. That, that would complicate things, but it's not going to give us anything really deep. Really, it's how far away from the center you are that we really care about. So we're only going to work with the dt and the dr terms in the metric. We're not going to worry about that r squared d omega squared term. So with that in mind, we can look at the trajectories of light in the Schwarzschild and in the Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates by setting ds squared equal to zero. And in Schwarzschild, we of course have, again, just ignoring the angular term, we have that. And for Eddington-Finkelstein, we have this. And then um, to get a visual representation of what's going on, um, I'm actually going to graph on a space-time diagram the light cones. Okay. So let's let's do the Schwarzschild case over here. So um, for the Schwarzschild case, uh, it helps. Uh, okay, one of the nice things you see because we're doing this radially is that I can literally take this term, move it to the other side of the equal sign, and then find an expression for dr dt. Or alternatively, I can find an expression for dt dr. It doesn't matter which one, but for graphing, this is going to be the easier one. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll do this dt dr plus or minus 1 minus 2 gm over r to the minus 1. Okay. And the reason I do that is because my space-time diagram, I'm going to plot t on the vertical, r on the horizontal, and so this is just telling me about the slope. Rise over run. Okay. Now, let's, does everybody see where this would come from, this expression? I don't have to do that. Okay, good. Okay, so let's actually take this and consider some limits. Okay, so first of all, if we go to r uh, goes to infinity, what does this become? Plus or minus one. Okay, so dt dr in this limit goes to plus or minus one. Which means if I go way, way out in the r-axis, then my light cones open up at 45 degrees. That is completely what we should have expected. If you get far enough away from anything, you should go back to flat space. Unless, of course, you're solving for a geometry that's asymptotically de -sitter or anti de -sitter like you did in your homework. In case you didn't realize that. If R is 2GM, what is dt dr? Infinite. Yeah, it's diverging. Okay. So on our graph, there is a special value of R, 2GM, where the slope of the light cones is closing up. Okay. So now what we can see is the following behavior. As we move closer and closer to the value r equals 2gm, it's a pretty mild effect until you get really close. But the closer you get, the more your light, your light cones close up until at exactly the value r equals 2gm, the light cone is totally closed and it's pointing vertically upwards. Okay. And so the flow of the inward going light cones is something like this, where these trajectories all asymptotically approach that vertical line of R equals 2GM. So as you move inwards, starting here, in time, you're going upwards in time, you're moving along this trajectory, but your light cone is closing up as you get closer and closer. So, the, the problem with trying to use Schwarzschild coordinates to describe what's happening 
is exactly reflected in the fact that the light cones are closing up. When a light cone is completely closed, it's like, what do I do with that? Like, where can you go? You can go in the light cone, but the light cone looks like that. There's nowhere to go. Okay. Crazy stuff should not be happening at 2GM, folks. Remember what we said? It's a coordinate singularity. It's not like the curvature is going to infinity. Like, this, the geometry is not doing anything super crazy at R equals 2GM. But in these coordinates, it looks like something really weird is happening. But that's okay. These are bad coordinates. We want good coordinates. So let's look at how Eddington Finkelstein plays out. And this is where, of course, the magic is going to emerge. So uh, in the Eddington Finkelstein case, this plays out very differently. So uh, we've got this expression that we want to toy with. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression and we are going to study various ways to get this thing to vanish. And I'm going to give you three categories of how to make that vanish. The first way to make it vanish is, yeah, let's do this one first. I didn't do it this way in my notes, but I want to do it this way today. Is for dr over dv to be 1 half 1 minus 2gm over r. Okay? Look at that for a minute. If you move this over to the other side and then divide by dv squared, the dv squared there disappears. This becomes dr over dv. The two goes over under there. And so you end up with exactly that expression. It's algebra. I'm sure you can follow that, given enough time and energy. What we discover, interestingly, is that if r is larger than 2gm, is this quantity positive, negative, zero, or diverging? It's negative. This is less than zero if R is greater than 2GM. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's greater than zero. I'm being totally crazy. If R is greater than 2GM, the denominator is bigger. Sorry, got myself backwards. If R is less than 2GM, this quantity is less than 2GM. It's negative. Okay. We're all on board? All right. If R is equal to 2GM, it's zero. Okay. So we've kind of got this. That kind of makes sense. If you're bigger, you're positive. If you're smaller, you're negative. To connect the positive to the negative, you've got to go through zero. Uh, another way to make this thing vanish is to take dr to be zero and take R equals to 2GM. Okay. If dr is zero, then this term vanishes. If r is equal to 2gm, this term vanishes. So that whole thing is zero. And then the last way to do it is to actually take dv to zero. Because if dv is zero, this term vanishes and this term vanishes. Okay. Now this one is actually interesting because if dv is zero, then that means that v itself is a constant. Okay? And if V is a constant, then that means that T plus R plus 2GM natural log of R over 2GM minus 1 is a constant. And what we discover from that expression is that as T increases, R decreases in order for the value of that to remain constant. Here we go, you ready? Let's put it all together. Holistic. You ready? Okay. So let's draw a picture. That is black hole. Took me a while. I need an infinite amount of ink. This is the radial distance r equals 2gm from r equals 0. If we are outside of the black hole, that is r is greater than 2gm, then we have an outward going trajectory from solution A. 
If we are outside of the black hole, then we have an inward going trajectory from solution C. Okay? This is, this, as T increases, R decreases, no matter where you are, according to C. PGM doesn't play a particularly special role. If we are inside of R equals 2GM, we have an inward going trajectory from A and from C, we have an inward going trajectory. Okay? And then of course at R equals 2GM, we have a stationary trajectory from B. And then we also, of course, have an inward going trajectory from A. From C? Oh, sorry, from C. Right. Now, what are, what are we describing? Event horizon. Well, but what, what object are we describing with paths of ds squared equals zero? Light. Light. So we're talking about where can light go. As long as you're outside of R equals 2GM, light can go away from that to larger radius or it can go to smaller radius. But once you are inside R equals 2GM, even light has to only go towards R equals zero. You, my friend, are slower than light. So if light has to do this, you have to do this. Now a cool observation at exactly the horizon, you can fire a photon outwards and it will hang there. Of, of course you expect that though because on the outside light can go out, on the inside light must go in, so as you go from out to in, there's got to be a trajectory that's at rest. So is the event horizon for something massive different than light? Yeah. Okay. The event horizon, so, so You've named it, but that's what it is. R equals 2GM is, of course, the event horizon of the black hole. And the event horizon is, by definition, where it's the point beyond which nothing can come back. And that includes light, but it also includes you if you take in the largest energy, energy propulsion supply you can imagine. This is an interesting, and you're going to have an interesting homework problem, uh, analyzing this. One of these trajectories is if you turn your thrusters on towards the origin, the other one is if you turn your thrusters on away from the origin. It doesn't matter. You're still going to R equals well, zero. The interstellar they found, like a tesseract. <laughs> 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 the word can't be wrong. Wow. I was so waiting for it. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Do similar boundaries exist further out? Like, could you calculate, like, for an object with so much energy, like where that boundary is from a black hole? Like when no, because this energy. event horizon arises from a density. It okay. doesn't arise from a total amount of energy. It's a certain amount of energy pushed inside of a, of a volume. That's why, it's R, that's why M and R are related in the condition. Okay. So I'm going to finish with just a graph analogous to this for the light cones in Eddington Finkelstein, and that is another way of seeing the effect of the event horizon. So in the Eddington-Finkelstein case, what we discover, if we graph things, is the following. First of all, I'm going to define a new time coordinate uh, that is V minus R. And if you use that new time coordinate in place of the V, then at infinity, that time coordinate asymptotically becomes the same time coordinate used in Schwarzschild. This metric is kind of weird when you go to R equals infinity. It's not obvious that it's the same geometry as Schwarzschild, which it is the same geometry, just the metric looks weird. So if I use this T-twiddle, then asymptotically far away, the light cones should look the same. And so in terms of T-twiddle and R, what we find is if we're very far away, we have outgoing trajectories from solution, and I think this was A, ingoing trajectories from solution uh, C. I'm actually switching notation from my notes, so I hope I get this right. 
And as we get closer, what eventually happens is that there is the value r equals 2gm. But what happens to the light cones is that the inward trajectories from C never change. The trajectories from C aren't going to do anything interesting. They're always just going to be the radially inward trajectories. But the trajectories from A are folding up. So that at exactly r equals 2gm, you still have the inward trajectory from C, but the inward trajectory from A looks like that. And if you go to a smaller value of r, now you have <coughs> your inward trajectory from C and again an inward trajectory from A. So what we discover is that by using Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates, first of all, the light cones never go completely closed up. Okay, when the light cones close up, I, I just can't talk about what's happening. It doesn't make sense. The light cones never actually close up until you get to r equals zero, and then who cares? Secondly, this shows you exactly why when you're outside of a black hole, you can stay outside of a black hole. Remember, you live in your future light cone. But as soon as you get to r equals 2gm, your future light cone is the interior of the black hole. And there's no escaping that. Huh? What? He said a Pirates of the Caribbean quote. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll end there today. And what we'll talk about uh, when we get back next time is, first of all, using eddington Tinkelstein coordinates to describe what a person on the outside sees when another person goes into a black hole, then this shit's going to get real. Alex, are you going to talk about the pictures of the black hole that are coming out tomorrow at 7 a.m. Mountain Time? No, I'm not going to talk about that. What's the lecture on Thursday? The lecture on Thursday is going to be the one that will rock the world. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I might not even put the topic on the website until oh Thursday. Oh. All right. See you guys on Thursday. Gosh, don't you know things? You can't take a picture of the